Hey, we are live. Hello, everyone. I'm Jennifer Himes. And if you follow this channel, you probably know that I'm a puppeteer. And uh, even though I have been working with puppets for about 10 years, I'm actually kind of new to the puppets community because just about three years ago, I decided to start taking the art form more seriously. So anyway, I want to learn as much as I possibly can. And I thought the best way to do that is to talk to other puppeteers. So I decided, well, I could probably interview puppeteers and that would be really fun, but I wanted to make it unique. So I am starting this series, Women in Puppetry Interviews. And, you know, since I am one, I'm also fairly interested in the subject matter. So um, I'm very excited about this and we're going to start these off with a bang by interviewing the talented Nicola. Nicola McEldowney is a New York City-based actress and puppeteer. She is debuting the second season of her web series, Callie and Izzy, October 6th, yeah. I believe, mm -hmm. this Thursday. And she regular, regularly performs other characters in her own shows for children and adults alike. Thank you so much for joining me, Nicola. Yay, thank you for having me. So, first things first, um, tell us a little bit about Callie and Izzy. So Callie and Izzy is a web series that tells a story of a girl who ends up with the dread disease, puppetitis B, which puts a puppet on your hand uh, that, that you can't get off. It's, the puppet is literally a disease growing out of your hand. And oh dear. <laughs> You have this evil little friend on your hand, that, or evil little friend of me on your hand that goes around messing up your life in different ways. And there is no known cure, at least without giving away spoilers, there is no known cure at the end of season one. And with season two, we'll see what happens. Okay, all right. Wow, that, what was the inspiration for that? It started out as a series of jokes I, was telling out loud one day to my friend over lunch and I wrote them down on a notepad. I, I write incoherent things on my phone. It's pretty much like a greenhouse of little fledgling incoherent jokes. And <laughs> I had all these jokes about a girl growing a puppet on her hand and telling her doctor, oh, you know, doctor, what do I do? I have a puppet growing out of my hand. He's like, what do you want me to do about it? You know, it, it just sort of sprouted out of that whole exchange between Callie and her doctor. That was the genesis for the whole thing. Um, and of course, it ended up moving in very different directions after that. But the real genesis, genesis, even before all those jokes and stuff, um, was a number of friends of mine said to me at different times, you're a puppeteer that's so fun and amazing. You should do a web series about your life as a puppeteer. And I was always like, but that would be so dull. It would just be me sitting on the subway muttering bad words because I'm late for the next gig, carrying 10 bags of crap, you know, just be like, I can't, I can't, I can't do this. And boy, who would watch this? And then at some point it occurred to me that writing a web series was basically no different than writing a comic strip which is something I'm familiar with because I grew up in a house with comic strips, which I'll maybe get more right, into later. Right. My dad's a cartoonist and the way that comic strips are structured and written and released is something that was very familiar to me from growing up. And I started to realize, well, why don't I make it more of a comic strip-esque sort of plot, which translated into, I have a puppet growing out of my hand. And as soon as it was that situation, it was so much more writable, you know, than, uh, my literal life, which as I say is me with bags of stuff going off to do children's shows because it pays the bills. And it's often rewarding and it's sometimes fun and all sorts of positives, but it's also not necessarily what I would call solid entertainment. So this, this was a better bet. This is just a, a better choice all around. I'm sure more people sure, sure. would have after one week of me on the subway. That's where you can find me. That's awesome. Oh man. I I have enjoyed watching Callie and Izzy. It's, Thank you. it's really, really fun. Um it's interesting that it came about like that you that you 
kind of worked out worked it out with thinking of it as a comic strip. Yeah, because the whole idea of a short form web series was kind of daunting to me because as a kid, I loved to write what I considered to be sitcoms. And, you know, I learned how to write like a 30 page script, with a, not 30 page, 30 minute, 22 page with three act structure and all of that. And I was just like, well, how can you tell a funny story in three minutes? And I realized, duh, it's comics. Of course you can tell a funny story. You can tell a funny story in one minute. And, you know, in theater and stuff, people are popping up all over the place with like one minute play festivals, one minute film festivals. I started to realize right. this was more than viable. This is almost becoming the norm in a way, micro storytelling. Mm -hmm. it, it presents itself as a viable opportunity for people who have maybe limited budgets, limited resources, or just want to tell a, story, a short story. So it was right, a right. viable option. And I don't know why I didn't think of the parallel to comic strips in the first place. Maybe because it is so familiar that I just didn't think of the obvious. But once I thought comic strip, I was like, oh, it's you know basically a setup, an extended setup, and a development, and a gag line. And that's what Callie and Izzy essentially is. We have a little more time to breathe because I don't have any real constraints on it, but basically kept to sort of an average two, three minute format. Yeah, that's, that's so cool. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, um, uh, I forgot how long ago it was now. I think it was, I guess it was at um, the end of last year, or something, or maybe the beginning of this year, I forgot. But um, I, I decided to try to do uh, an Instagram video every day and try to, you know, build upon a story. And so, and at the time, it was only 15 seconds. That's all you had. <laughs> and so I had 15 seconds to add to a piece of the story and like tell that part so of the story continuous like 15 and then 50 i don't think i followed you yet at the time because i have no memory of this I don't, yeah yeah but then i i put it all together into one video and i put it on youtube okay but, um search it out yeah it was it was uh when um uh baby banana was trying to get the cookies off the counter no and so every day no, there was <laughs> <laughs> Every day there was like a little another fifteen second thing, and I was like, "Man, it takes an hour to do a fifteen second video. <laughs> this is so ridiculous." Oh, yeah. But I, I had very little plan. I would just, I had very little written at all. I would just be like, "Oh, what's she gonna do today? Oh, I guess she'll try using a grappling hook to try to get the cookie." <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but was so I can. Or was it partial? I mean, partially scripted, partially improv. It was, it was pretty much, um, I had like the basic storyline, like she's going to try to get the cookies, but she can't. And then every day she's gonna try something new yeah. to attempt to get the cookies. At one point I was like, I want her to like jump or swing or something to try to get them, but then hit something, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, but, um, but pretty much everything else was just like, oh, what's she gonna do today? Mm, I guess she's gonna do this. You know, I would come home from work and I'd, I'd set something up in the kitchen and, and do it. But it was, yeah, so anyway, that just made me think of that because it was very much like, it was almost like a one frame of the comic, you know? Right. It was I'm like, okay. I feel like oh, she does this. I go through this every day. Like, I'm gonna do four panels in this story, but it may only advance us this like, microscopic point in the story and then tomorrow's going to be another microscopic point. My father does this all the right. time. He'll do like one tiny event in a continuum of a big event. The next day is a tiny event and you know people have to know uh, from the viewpoint of the reader that this is all going to be compiled at the end in a graphic novel and it's all going to be all of a sudden it's all going to pace itself so much more rapidly when you can flip the pages and turn right. back and forth and you know see it all together. Yeah, yeah. I think sometimes, I think sometimes a story can almost be more satisfying if it's given to you in those tiny little increments. Because yeah. I don't know, you have more time to think about it, you know. And and sometimes I think uh, stories that go at a slower pace can often be uh, um, satisfying. 
Yeah, yeah, a little bit. I, sometimes I feel like stories just go so fast, and it's like I have no time to sit and just think about what's going on. But yeah, um, I that I mean, yeah, you know, big Hollywood blockbusters do sort of move at that frenetic pace because yeah. that's what I think the mainstream wants to watch a lot of the time. They don't want to link right. small details. Yeah, you know, there are a lot of Lois get annoyed at that You're like oh, I don't want somebody <laughs> reaching for a thing and then get, taking the thing and then drinking the thing and then putting the cap right <laughs> you know I understand that but you know with a good artist the payoff is going to be impressive so you know you feel like saying okay just wait just wait just see what's gonna happen I, I, I yeah I, I kind of like lingering over a panel like you know an individual pa I like going on the tumblr and seeing uh, individual panels of comics I like so oh yeah yeah that is so cool anyway awesome so here comes the big question the big one Nicola are you ready yes okay here we go why puppetry? I started out acting, um, acting, acting. And mm -hmm. I was already fixed on puppetry from a very young age as an observer of puppetry. I would watch a show called Storytime on PBS, which it was real short lived, which means that rarely do I meet people who know it. I meet people who remember it, but it's, they're, they're few and far. Yeah. This came out of Los Angeles. It was pretty low budget. It was the same principle as Reading Rainbow, but with a puppet, with a puppet that was one of the hosts. They had a couple human hosts and then the puppet would like co-host with them. The puppet was named Kino and it was performed by a guy named Mark Ritz who has mm -hmm. since passed away, but he was also on Beekman's World and some other stuff. So he was a costume actor and, and a comedian actor, puppeteer as well as other things. And his mm -hmm. folks were puppeteers, but anyway. Long story short, um, so that planted a real early seed for me. I mean, story time, I was obsessed, beyond obsessed with that puppet as a child. I drew pictures of him all the time. I mean, that was like my first love, this, this puppet. And um, honestly, I think after years of acting, because I started acting around 10, I had seen that show around five. I wasn't really thinking about it by 10, acting up through high school, college, and into, into college. Um, my junior year of college, I went to France and um, I had a chance to do what they called a directed research project as one of my study abroad courses on like anything I wanted. And I said, well, can I do puppetry? Because it's a big thing over there. And it, I mean, it's a big thing over here, but in, in a different and sort of marginal uh, sense, I feel like. And my program director, when I asked, could I do puppetry? She was like, oh my God, that's amazing. Yes, do puppetry. She was so delighted by that idea. And I think what, what what struck me even at that moment was, I didn't know I was gonna say that, but, hello. I didn't know I was gonna say that, but it had just been in the back of my mind, kind of ready to put itself out there the whole time mm -hmm. since I had watched Storytime, and since I had watched Sherry Lewis on Lamb Chops play along, and since I had watched Sesame Street, and right. Just right. you know, story time, not story time at the capital S, but just like regular story time at our local bookstore where somebody was using puppets. I don't remember what they were, but I definitely had this idea of puppets as a tool that you could use to tell stories. And I love telling stories. I love reading stories. And so that was, it, it was all right there. It was just, I think, late in, waiting to come out at the right time. And I didn't realize that it was a way I could make money through acting. That... I was sitting on had not occurred to me good to know but <laughs> you know it hadn't occurred to me um it that would that would come up a little later as a sort of reveal it was like oh oh good thing um that that, that helps me live so <laughs> that's I great he was talking about story time in margaret's so i was talking about going to france and doing this project and puppetry as be oh yeah i think essentially when we act and i don't mean to get too lofty here because what do i know but i think essentially when we act we are being human puppets anyway the character is coming through us as a vessel we're the vessel for the character the character's already written the playwright already made the character so we're like the casing through which the character comes out and 
Right. Yeah. Puppet, therefore, you know, you, you kind of have to be a good actor to be a good puppeteer. I mean, you do have to. It doesn't mean that you have to be trained or experienced. It just means naturally you have to understand how to project a character through you because once you can project a character through you, you can project the character through the puppet. It's just like a peripheral body that's doing the same as your main body does. Yeah, it's that makes total sense. Bring it on your hand or in some case onto your full body because you you know, you might do like a, I don't know, a puppet that involves your legs or whatever. I've seen plenty of that. Sure, yeah, one of the, um, like a full body costume yeah. puppet, like you were saying, yeah. It's not real different. I mean, it's right. different what costume characters do. They're just, they, you know, just experience more heat stroke. But <laughs> <laughs> True, true, yeah. They have to, They're project they have to go to the chiropractor a little more often. Sorry. <laughs> they have to go to the chiropractor a little more often. Maybe. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to do it. I, <laughs> do. I know really good puppeteers who do that, and they're probably extra good at oh, yeah. because they mm -hmm. have the puppetry experience, and they do have the experience of acting through an external body. There's some people right, who right. get into puppetry, and this has always fascinated me, people who get into puppetry because they're good at acting or they're good at some or another art, but they're really shy, and puppetry is more germane to their way of being and presenting themselves than straight up acting would be because the puppet is not really them, although it is, or else this wouldn't be so amazing that they can do that. But I do know one or two people who would never really naturally be at home going out on stage and being like, you know, I'll be oh, I don't know, Mary Poppins today, but they would totally be comfortable having a puppet go out and imitate Julie Andrews singing Feed the Birds. You know, you're me. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I hear you. I, you know, I see, I, I meet people like that and it makes sense in a way. It's like people who like to dress up at Halloween or at Comic Cons because yeah. they can be a character for a day. They don't have to be them. Right, you right. Have to have the insecurities that might go with being them. Not that they should necessarily have those insecurities. I'm not going to pronounce on that. I don't know these hypothetical people. But, you know, it's, it's something that they can act through. And there's so much theorizing done about this in the more academic circles of people, especially in France and Europe, who talk about puppets as, you know, the puppet as an objet d'art and the puppet as, like, a, an additional entity that does special things that we can't do and there is right i'm not into academic theorizing one bit for a person who did a lot of school i am so unacademic it's ridiculous <laughs> but there is there is something to be chewed on in that and if i had done any more like thesis work past you know I, I did one year of graduate school. I, I mean, I finished graduate school. I did one year past uh, past college, and then I was like, I'm done. I'm done with school forever. That's it. <laughs> yeah. But if I ever had to do more work, I would want to, you know, study or at least think about, I guess, think about that more, the, the extent to which puppets um, have more agency than the humans who are operating them, because they can get away with stuff, not just, like, dirty stuff or stuff that we don't expect or... It's not just the shock factor, it's it's the extent to which they can make people happy the way that puppies and kitties and balloons can make people happy and people respond to them even in the most, you know, stressful or otherwise unpuppety of, you know, situations. I've had the experience of rushing through, I tell people this all the time, I've had the experience of rushing through Grand Central at rush hour with a puppet and watching, you know, busy commuters going back to like Connecticut or whatever, stop and see the puppet and go, oh, you know, their face is just like, and like, oh my God, a moment ago, you were only thinking about, am I going to catch the 605 to Darien, you know, and then they see the puppet and they're like, ah, oh, puppet. They, you know, and if the puppet talks to them, oh my God, they become babies. Not, not the commuters. I was rushing too. I wasn't going to try and talk to the commuters. I just noticed that people's eyes in a hugely frenetic, crowded, crazy Grand Central would go to the puppet. And, uh, right. That, that was amazing to me. I was like, usually those people are one track. We're all thinking about the train. We're all thinking about getting on the train before other people get on the train and getting back, you know. No, it's all about the puppet. I mean, not everyone. Yeah, that's awesome.
some people are still one track and I don't blame them, but <laughs> you know. right. yeah. Oh yeah. They're, they're not phased by it at all. Some people yeah. aren't phased by it, but then there's those few people, a uh, majority of people I would say who are like, Oh, puppet, yay. <laughs> yeah. They become little kids. They're just, Yeet. and they, they only focus on the puppet. Like you are gone. You're not even there. It's like, Oh, it's this bright colored thing. That's yes. fluffy. They <laughs> like, I understand this with toddlers, which is probably the biggest demographic I work with, with preschoolers, with kids. I totally understand that when they don't notice I'm there, because I'm always right there. A couple reasons for that. The main one being that I always want to see what's going on with the audience firsthand. So if I'm losing them, I can switch gears real quickly. If I'm only hearing them right. way under something, it's way harder to. Right, see right. That makes what's sense. What's going on, you know. Um, there are a couple other reasons for it too, which I'll, I can get into if it comes up. But basically, the thing that always astounds me is that the adults forget I'm there too. And the adults are literally like, oh my God, look at the puppet, I want to touch him. If the puppet talks to them, sometimes they just like, they don't get shy exactly, but they become under its spell. And I'm like, you know, I'm like this fleshy thing that's literally like right here. Hello, you see me? <laughs> no, they don't really see it. it takes over. I, yeah, yeah. I don't know if it means I'm a good puppeteer or if it just means I am a puppeteer that has a puppet, but well, I'll take it one way or another because I think it's fascinating and funny. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that's so awesome. All of that, just really good stuff. Man. Um, I was going to say something, and I totally I keep losing lost it. Oh. Track of my thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's okay. Um, Oh, oh, I know. I remember I was going to say, um, I work, I, well, I used to work with uh, college students in uh, the church I was at in Pensacola. And um, there would be these little college freshman girls are in their like, second semester of school and they're shy and they're quiet and they're like really mousy when they're behind, like in front of the stage. Mm -hmm. But then you put them behind the stage and they put a puppet on their hand, and all of a sudden they're like, blah, 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 <laughs> like, and I'll be, they'll practice, and I'll say, okay, who, who was that? And I'll look through the stage, I'll look over the stage, and I was like, how could that have been you? <laughs> that could not possibly have been you. Yeah. And, and they're like, it's a phenomenon that happens. It's just I know it's so crazy and I totally identify with it as well because I tend to be I'm, I tend to be naturally shy and so um, like I was saying to you earlier I, I have to really kind of push myself to to even do something like this is um, it's, it's been a lot of work for me to to get to this point um, a lot of it was in high school but um, uh, you know even through when I was in college doing the same puppet ministry at church, you know, having to get through a lot of uh, insecurities and, and stuff and, and puppetry helped with that. And so, um, yeah, being on a big stage in front of a lot of people would just totally freak me out. But then if I had a puppet, for some reason, that would not be a problem. <laughs> I do not know what that's about, but I love it. I'm not sure. I, I it's great. I think it's a great thing, and I think it's great for, you know, I I hear a lot about um, people who, um, you know, work in uh, schools with kids trying to be in theater, you know, and they're like, oh, they're too shy to go out and do something. Well, we'll do a puppet show. And then all of a sudden, everybody can do it. You, know? <laughs> you find out there's a lot more to these kids than what they present normally. Right, right. It's so interesting. And the whole psychology around puppetry is, I think, way deeper than... Um, there's a lot am, built into... Actually, I, I love psychology. Uh, doing puppetry has only made me more interested in it, I think. Just as a sort of yeah. actor, I don't think I would go into it, although never say never with that one, but it's yeah. definitely something that there's there's a big amount of intersection. Right, yeah. Um, as far as like being an artist, I've always been interested in like how colors and shapes and everything 
affect us um, psychologically, you know, because we, we feel things yeah. when we see colors, but we don't always realize what we're feeling. And so it, it, there's a psychology of color too. And, and so, um, so I think that the, that there's, um, there's a correlation there as well. There's this, it, it's, it's in the same vein as that, you know, being interested in how art affects our brains and then you know because puppetry is an art form just like any other but um um yeah that's always been interesting to me just um and there are people who yeah. have synesthesia too where they like feel colors and um let's see they would hear visual phenomena or right right you know see sounds that kind of thing mm -hmm. yeah yeah yeah, that's always been cool. So cool. Um, so how about this? Like, okay, when I was first researching, like, this was like three or four years ago, I guess, when I was first trying to figure out, okay, how can I be a professional puppeteer like how do I get work <laughs> doing this and um, <laughs> I was <laughs> I know right I was I think I was working as an illustrator at the time and I was coming home and I was like I don't like this anymore oh, and oh. Um, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm trying to work through my thoughts um, yeah. so I was researching how to learn how to get to this point where I could where I could do this and um, all I could ever find was information on like the core Muppet performers like who started out with Jim Henson you know Dave Gold and Steve Whitmire and and those guys and I mean, we live in a different time now, and I mean, we don't get started the same way. I'm always making this point, especially with friends that are older, not to try to explain yeah. it to them per se, because they know, but we're always talking about how there is such a divide between the way that you have to pay to play to do things now, which is, I'm so against that in every possible way. I'm sure there has to be some exception, but you know, there's got to be a non-paying way to do this. Right. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's all I could ever find. And I was I was so frustrated because I was like, but how do I do it now? Like <laughs> you know, how is it done now? And I've noticed that the more reach into the choir, I said I'm always <laughs> yeah. and in twenty sixteen. Right. And I noticed that um some of the more recent Muppet performers, they they have more straight up acting experience. Mm -hmm. So, um, so kind of going back to what we're to, I guess the beginning what we we're talking about was, um, do you do you think it's important for a puppet for a puppeteer to be able to do both? Or, or work professionally even at both actor and puppeteer? Like if they wanna be a puppeteer, mm -hmm. do you think it's like essentially important to be um, like professional actor, at least minded? I think just to have a native sympathy for acting and maybe I could go as far as saying a native talent for acting, not necessarily to work professionally at both. I mean, time might not even permit if you're lucky and you get a lot of work puppeteering. Um, but I think a lot of people do go into puppetry because they are already, you know, natural actors or experienced actors. I think if it's not entirely necessary, it's 99% necessary because like I was saying earlier, if you know how to channel a character through yourself, it's going to make it that much more native to you to channel that character through, as I say, an external body, a puppet, a thing that's right. beyond you, your physical self. So short answer, yes, I think it's absolutely necessary. Um, there are people though, and this is like the, the other category that I'm 
thinking of when I say almost entirely. There are people who are, they come to puppetry through a different art or profession, people who come to it through graphic arts. And I used to meet and still meet today a lot of those who come through, who come to it through, you're an illustrator, you know, you know what I'm talking about. There are people who write right. through, um, oh, I don't know. I've met people who come to it through sculpting. I've met people who come to it through some sort of plastic arts, through printmaking, through doll making. Um, you know, people who took a sock puppet class one time and decided I'm, I'm gonna do this thing. People who watch tutorials online and learned how to, you know, make puppets and then they started performing those same puppets they made. In those cases, you know, they're not necessarily actors by trade, but they have, or artists by trade, but they have a native feeling for it and talent for it that informs what they do as puppeteers. And it's interesting also to see the ways in which somebody who comes to puppetry from, say, oh, I, I don't know, uh, you know, name, name a graphic art, somebody who comes to puppetry from painting or something like that is a different kind of puppeteer almost necessarily than somebody who comes to it from theater. You know, the former person is probably going to be much, not, not always, but it's probably going to be much more of a builder and right. much more visually attuned to aspects of the profession and performance that the actor actor might not even think about. Right, right. Well, like Dave Goltz, he came through, what, engineering? Something? Like, he was an engineer. Yeah, that's right? true, isn't it? I forgot about that. Yeah. I did. I can't think for the life of me who it was, but I have met somebody who came to it through architecture, so it's totally possible. Right. I don't think that was him. It's somebody I met but anyway they, people come through it to it through a lot of different arts that's for sure yeah I think that also calls to like um this aspect of it being a kind of a melting pot of many different art forms and you know puppetry there's pieces of all these different art forms kind of all together in one little fuzzy box it is a and um in a fuzzy box what was that I said it is what was that pot, and then i added in a fuzzy box i like that <laughs> and um I, i've always been fascinated about that it's um i mean every time every time i would learn something else about it it'd be like oh that's kind of like this thing over here and that's kind of like that over there. And you have to have, I mean, at least a little bit of knowledge about a lot of different things in order to do puppetry, or I think. Or of any kind, I think it all in Right. You. But especially puppetry, because it is both visual and physical and it's acting and it's graphic art. Um, I One thing that popped into my head is another category of people, you know, in terms of what professions have people been in before they were puppeteers. Another one that I've run into sometimes is teachers and librarians who ended up being puppeteers, if not professionally, at least as part of their, you know, first profession. Right. And that one, I almost want to say that's the same as being an actor who becomes a puppeteer because they are so used to being up in front of people and working a crowd, working a crowd anyway. <laughs> right that's so true you know those are the same people who are usually the best at doing like community theater and I'm not saying oh they only do community theater it's like it, it, if they have another job then if they do theater it's gonna be like at night when everybody can make the rehearsals and they're usually the people who are the most pro at it because they even if they're not like technically trained or whatever and there are a lot of ways to train but these are people who, as I say, are accustomed to being up in front of people and gauging how the crowd is feeling and how to switch gears and do something else if the crowd is not into you and so forth. Mm -hmm. and I have met some who become puppeteers because, you know, they were in a classroom where there were a lot of dolls and they would wiggle the dolls around. And I mean, parents become actors in the same way, let's face it. Sure, sure, yeah. All the voices. <laughs> All the voices in the storybook, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Oh, this is such good stuff. 
Wait, no, there's all this other stuff. That's questions. I, I'm like the queen of going off on tangents, so I don't know how good that is for your interview purposes. Actually. Oh no, this is great. This is awesome. I'm so excited. I yeah. want these to be like, like when I was when I was searching for information. This is what I wanted to be able to find. Like, <laughs> okay, that's better than. Oh my god! I, I, yeah, this this is not what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> <They stop talking. laughs> no, this is great. This is um, this is exactly what we're looking for. Information that is relevant to um, today and not from like what ten years ago, <laughs> which is what yeah, which is all the. <laughs> I was in high school, so it's not really going to help you. <laughs> yeah, like when I was searching a few years ago, I was like, I can't find anything that's relevant. It's all like 10 years old. I can't find anything. So that's what I want these interviews to be, is something that other people can look to and be like, oh, this is this is like good information that I can use I right now. Here. Yes, awesomeness. Okay. Um, a couple other questions. We have time. We have time, hey. right? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, my first my first alarm just went off, but um, we we got time. We're good. Oh. All right. Good. Um, we are moving right along. Um, can you tell puppeteers have nothing to do at night? <laughs> <laughs> this is what we do on the weekends. We put puppets on and play. That's it was so funny. I, when I was first making puppets, I was like, this is what I do on Friday nights. I sew and I put the puppet on and I play with it. Yum. That's that's my Friday nights. <laughs> Wee. That's my kind of Friday night. I mean there are people who have puppet parties. There are people who, you know, they get together with other puppeteers yeah. and drink. I mean, not necessarily drink, but if you're into that, and you know, you make puppets. <laughs> right, but I mean, I didn't have friends who were interested in puppetry. So, like in Pensacola, none of my friends were interested in puppetry. I mean, I, you know, are passing interest. So it was like... You're in Atlanta, are you? Uh, No, not right now. I was going to say you wouldn't be in South Georgia. I was going to say just because... I was I was wondering how close you were to the Atlanta puppetry community with the Center for Puppetry Arts and everything. I'm looking for a job in Atlanta. That's that's my kind of goal. Or obviously Orlando. We were talking about that already. But yeah, so something like that. Something in a bigger city because right now it's like tiny city and there's nothing happening at all. Anyway. <laughs> um so who are some of your puppetry heroes? I talked a bit about a couple of them earlier. I talked about yeah. Sherry Lewis. I was actually just watching some of her early stuff uh, the other night. Yes. It, was, it was wonderful to see because it was wonderfully low budget, but also just fueled by so much talent. And what she does is so hard to do. And, you know, I would watch Lamb Chops play along on PBS as a child. And I had no concept of what she was doing. I mean, I knew what she was doing because my dad told me she's a ventriloquist. That means she's actually talking, but she's talking like this on the phone who's next to her. I'm not a very right, good right. But um, it's something that she does with so much technique that you can barely tell what's going on in her neck and face. You can if you watch hard enough, but it's minimal. It's just, she's so good at what she's doing, and it. You know, it makes up for whatever about the show is kind of lagging. And I mean, it's it was just this very, very low budget 70s show with some, oh, shall we say, archaic motifs and characters that speak in ways we wouldn't necessarily want them to speak on television now and so forth. <laughs> it's lovely to see and also lovely to see the lineage between this and her Lamb Chops play along that I watched so often as a little kid. Mm -hmm. and I just think she was extraordinary. I wish she were still alive. She should still be alive. She died early. But yeah, yeah. These people that I wish were still around so I could talk to her and, and be like, teach me what you're doing with your face. <laughs> I love that. It needs to be on like a t shirt or something. Teach me what you're doing with your face. <laughs> it could be interpreted a number of ways, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Awesome. You know, of course, Jim Henson, and of course, the Muppet puppeteers, the Muppet performers. Um, 
but there's nothing I can say that hasn't already been said in various ways. So I will skip right over yeah. And um, I mentioned Mark Ritz and Kino, the puppet that was on Storytime, that was the little orange baseball capped um, host. It was supposed to be, who was supposed to be a six year old bilingual boy, spoke Spanish and French and presented all the stories. And each episode he would have a different problem. One I remember is he lost his roller skates and you know, you were waiting to see what would happen. Would he find them by the end of the episode? And I was totally caught up in this question. I mean, spoiler, he did, but you know, I was, I was waiting on Tender well, did. as a five. <laughs> yeah, no, he did, but to see, see what would happen. And uh, you know, I think it was a testament to how well that guy was doing what he was doing that it never occurred to me, this six year old boy's voice has changed. <laughs> it never occurred to me. <laughs> you know, this is definitely a, a puppet with serious testosterone for a six year old. His <laughs> <laughs> voice was up here, but still, this is a male voice, you know. Um, right, yeah. As far as I was concerned, that was a six year old boy. That was my peer. That was, that was this puppet that was the same age and size as me, and this was my hero. And I really wish that I had gotten a chance to, uh, you know, let that puppeteer know in some way that what that meant to me it was quite obscure thing actually i never did because he also passed away early in life he was like 50 was quite young passed away from cancer and i wrote to his family but i actually don't know if they ever got the note so it's fine i hope they did you know i didn't need or want a response necessarily i just hope that they got it because right yeah you know i i don't i don't i don't know what you know, I haven't lost anybody close to me, super close to me, grandparents, but there's always a distance. I, you know, I don't know what that means to have a letter from a stranger. It may mean like nothing. It may be like, good, who cares? We miss our person, you know, but, um, which is a totally valid response. But, you know, I hope that it would have meant something in some way to say, oh, hey, somebody watched him as a kid and this meant a lot, you know, and it still does it's to this day. It's a show that I think about and I find old, usually really cruddy VHS clips of it, story time on <laughs> YouTube. Um, and, and they had storybooks, so it's, you know, it's like, it's, it's reading Rainbow, it's just reading Rainbow with a puppet. And, you know, the same sort of ongoing, like, parade of minor celebrities who come in and read a book. And, and um, <laughs> it was fun. Um, well, oh, another hero of mine that I should have mentioned right off, um, there's, uh, he, he's, uh, he was a puppeteer, in Paris in uh, 20th century. He did the bulk of his work in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And his name was Jacques Chenet, and he's also um, dead now. But he, uh, his daughter, who was, um, who was quite elderly by the time I met her, she ended up being sort of my, I don't know if she would have described herself this way. She ended up being sort of my puppetry mentor in Paris because she lived in this apartment in Paris that was like uh, sort of, of really well preserved museum of her father and, and her mother for that matter. Her mother was uh, ended up being a puppeteer because of what her father was doing. Um, of, of her parents' puppetry work, many of the original puppets and artwork, because her dad was also a painter, illustrator, much of that stuff was still preserved in this apartment so you could see what he had done. I ended up writing about her dad for my senior thesis because his work alone could fill that senior thesis. So I felt as though I intimately like knew this family and this puppeteer. His work was extraordinary. He made these beautiful puppets. He remade these beautiful puppets because they got destroyed in a fire during World War II when the center they were stored mm -hmm. at got like torched. And um, so he had to make his troop from scratch. They traveled all over Europe. They traveled to Asia, I think. They traveled everywhere. Definitely traveled to the U.S. because I remember her telling me they came to New York when she was young and she was asking me, did I ever go to the Natural History Museum? And I was like, you have to come over here one day, you know. She's like, oh, I haven't been there since I was. And she, she was a puppeteer herself in her younger age. And she was one of my heroes because I, I knew her and she was clearly so talented and, um, you know, encyclopedic about puppetry, puppetry in France, puppetry in Europe. Her name was Marion. I don't think I even said that, Marion Chenet. And she, um, as she got uh, older, I mean, by the time I met her, she had either Parkinson's or something, I don't know, that made her hands uh, palsied. But when she would take a puppet off the walk, let's say her house, puppetry museum, she'd take a puppet, like one of those puppets with the big hooks, like those old Sicilian or Belgian, like marionettes. She would start manipulating the thing and her hand, granted, okay, she's moving, 
but her hand seemed to calm when she had the puppet. It was as though the puppet was some sort of familiar thing. She's like, oh, this, this I know how to manipulate. And, I mean, she was so lucid anyway, but like her hands weren't. So it was as though they knew what to do as soon as the puppet was in them. And she passed away earlier this year. She was 81, 82, mm -hmm. something like that. And I was so sorry to hear it, but I think I learned more about a world of puppetry that, you know, is has pretty much disappeared with her at this point. And fortunately, I got to know about it, write about it, read about it. I have her dad's book that he wrote. It's like available nowhere except that she gave it to me. And so there's this whole little world of puppetry in Paris that I know about thanks to her and in a way thanks to her dad. So I, I miss her and I feel like I got to know him as well. He's not, he's famous in Paris. I don't think he is known in the U.S. at all. He might be known in like other places in Europe, but he there's very little information about him online, which is kind of insane when you consider this is a guy who was like a superstar in puppetry in France wow. and you know environs of Paris. But stuff gets you know sometimes stuff doesn't diffuse, and in those days, you know, no no social media, you know, no way to say. Right, no way to have right. A viral article saying this puppeteer in France had two troops and it's amazing. Click here, you know. So they, they did have a. Um, while I was there, I was lucky in that I got to go to Lyon in southeastern France and see um, his work on display at this exhibition at this puppetry museum that's there called the Musée Gadagne, and it's also the museum of the the city of Lyon. But it's. This is so French. It's the Museum of the City of Lyon and puppetry. And the puppetry half of the museum had at the time it was housing like Jacques Chenet entire, Jacques Chenet's entire uh, collection. The, the stuff that Marion, his daughter, didn't still like have at her house. I don't know what happened after she passed away, but I hope that that stuff is going to like, I don't know, the Museum of Decorative Arts or something because it, I, well, I know a, a, a number of them got auctioned off by Sotheby's, actually. I don't know what happened to the rest, but I hope people are going huh. to them. Be yeah, yeah. Wow. That's Somebody really awesome. Them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So awesome. If you have, like, links or about them, or even if you give me, like, yeah how to spell his name and everything, ah. just send that to me and I'll put it in the description. You bet. Like people can find that too, that'd be, that would be awesome. Um, so that's, that's so cool that you got to, got to meet his daughter and, and learn so much. That's, I that's learned cool. a lot from her. And the, the crazy thing also is that I just messaged you their names. Um, and I'll, I'll send oh, like, awesome. I'll have to do some research, but the, the coolest sure. thing about that is that it was, Purely by chance, I used to say that this has some truth to it only, that everyone in Paris knows a puppeteer. And the way that I knew her was, I told you much earlier in our chat about talking to my program director from Columbia when I was in Paris and her saying, oh yeah, you should do puppetry, that would be amazing. While we were having literally that conversation, she had just given me the go ahead, or it might have been our next conversation, but it was so early in the process. A friend of hers was eavesdropping on us from down the hall and she was like, puppetry i know somebody who does puppetry and it turned out to be madame chenet and so the next thing i knew we had been invited over to her apartment and this lady whom i'm still friends with thank goodness and uh you know acted as like the liaison between us introduced us and with madame chenet i would go back every time i visited france ever since i would go back and bring cookies and i would bring my own muppet puppets which she did not like at all she's like these are not puppets these are toys you know <laughs> she's like I, I remember when I was like, I, I heard she died and I was so sad. And one of the things I said is she thought my puppets were crap. <laughs> you know? I, like, I just love that about her. She's just like so opinionated about this. She's just like, this is not, and I know why it's because within the European tradition, this doesn't, this is like, this doesn't figure. This is, I mean, she knew about the Muppet show and the Muppet show, you know, it's like, who knows what yeah, yeah, yeah. This is like, what is that? I, I brought some puppets I had made, and to be fair, they were awful. They were like early puppets I had made. My late puppets are not like they're not amazing, but they're better. Um, these were pretty rudimentary, and I would I was like showing off with them and stuff, and she says, Ugh, "Get away from me!" 
loved it so much. I was trying to take pictures with my really bad phone I had at the time. I was like, look at this, you know, <laughs> this, this storied puppeteer, like being sort of gingerly holding my phone. <laughs> anyway, it was a wonderful visit. Oh, you visited that's, it, that's so great. Up until like not, I, I saw her about nine months before she died, and she was happy and active and talking about going to Asia because she loved to travel. So I don't think, I, I don't, I don't think she, you know, was frightened of anything. I think she was just like, hey, I'm gonna. Also, she was like, I'm phasing out of puppets now. I remember that she's like, I'm phasing out of puppets now. I'm thinking of going more into other fields, and she just had way more plans. I think that's the way to go. It's like have no idea you have ten months left if you can help it, you know. <laughs> like, right right it's like i don't, I don't oh, think man. she would have cared if she had known that was the impression i got this is great yeah yeah that's so awesome yeah. well some of your professional goals and what are you doing to move towards them besides maybe besides callie and izzy yeah, well, Callie and Izzy is pretty much wrapped now. We we did our season two, and you know, to an extent, there's always that question: Are we going to do more? The, the truth is, I don't think so. I, we could, but I think I pretty much effectively ended the story. And we recently did a season two screening. People were, you know, wonderfully receptive. They laughed a ton, and that was really all I wanted. And at the end of it, you know, a lot of people were like, "You're going to make season three and they were kind of disappointed and I was like, eh, I, don't, I, don't, I mean, maybe, I don't think so, no. But, you know, I, I right. don't know. But that's not because I don't want to do more, that's because I want to do other things. I want to do other projects. Cali and Izzy is great because it was kind of the foothold project. It has been a lot more people know what I'm doing now because of it and I'm really, really grateful about that. My ultimate professional goal is, has always been to make people laugh. I mean, I don't, People don't realize how hard that is. It's like, uh -huh. I, I mean, because somebody asked me, like, what were you hoping to achieve with this? It sounds like a snotty question. It wasn't like that. It was like, what were you hoping to? You know, <laughs> I was like, what, what is this crap? You know, at the end of the Kalina screening, somebody was like, well, what did you hope to achieve with this? And I said, oh, I already achieved this. Oh, no, what do you hope to going forward? And I said, oh, I pretty much already did it. I made everybody here laugh. They were like, oh, that's it? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I don't think you've had the experience, which I have, of seeing a play that I wrote, which I was in, put up before a big audience, and everybody's sitting there during the laugh lines going, which is just... Oh, man. Oh, that's death. <laughs> so, yeah, it's so bad. It's so death. Uh, I mean, you know, I feel this need to defend this experience now. We had bad audiences like that. We had good audiences. It was a mixed bag, like anything is a mixed bag. But it makes you appreciate it all the more when they act the way that you have targeted. So the course, way that it's yes. designed for them to react. It's a big deal. Um, my next project, uh, you know, as, as, I, as I say, I want to keep making people laugh. Sometimes it's not the only thing that I want them to do, but I want to keep making films because I think that it's, you know, obviously it's the dominant medium for storytelling in, you know, in the arts, but it's also, I think, the medium that is the most rewarding to produce and it gives you the most creative freedom to do things and redo things the way that you want to. And in that regard, um, I do have a next film that uh, I'm actually going to be going back to France to uh, shoot a little bit of pr principal photography for next month, which I'm excited about. Uh, oh, yeah, it's exciting. The, well, most of the film is going to be shot here, but it's a little short film. It started out as this massive, uh, you know, 120 page screenplay that became a 90 page screenplay that I was really trying to, you know, produce. And then it's like, I'm an idiot. This has got to be a short film. And it was another thing like with Kelly and Izzy where I was not convinced. It's like with that idea of web series about life as a puppeteer. This isn't interesting. Web series about life with a puppet on my hand. Totally interesting. Same thing here. I had to think about it a totally different way before I was able to say, I green light this. I can, it's a great thing about working for yourself. Nobody else has to green light things. I was like, I'm good. <laughs> right. Sometimes I'd way rather somebody else who were doing some of the work, but it's better this way. So I, uh, I finally 
was able to reconfigure the idea in my own head to be a much shorter, much more mm, condensed and above all surrealistic film, which took care of how to do a lot of scenes. It's like, if anything can happen in this world, that makes it a lot easier to do this bit here and this montage there and this bit of music and the fact that the seasons change without nice. working. And, um, it was like a fine, it's all part of the universe, things work. Um, and it does have to do with puppetry, but in a very peripheral way. Um, this, this film, it has to do with puppetry and that the main character does make puppets. And uh, it was actually inspired by, it's inspired by a couple things, but one of the things that inspired the short film itself, this like present and forthcoming iteration, was this video of puppeteers also happened to be from France, but I don't know them or anything. These puppeteers who were, uh, they were manipulating a marionette made out of ice. It was like an articulated marionette that during their performance, Whoa. Oh, yeah, they would watch it melt. I'll try to find this too. I, I want to see it again. They would like watch the puppet I melt. I've the seen that. Maybe from me. I mean, I might have posted it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. That's so interesting. It's bizarre in a way. It's like, oh my God, why would you go to the trouble of making this thing just to watch it melt? Yeah. But then you think about it, well, you know, snowmen, it's the same thing. We don't keep them in our freezer forever. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But it was one of the things, you know, I didn't want to get like too deep and ponderous, but there was a lot that you could do with that idea and how it relates to goals that we have that may melt over time and, you know, feelings that we have that transmute in their own way. So the film right. really has to do with what happens huh. when we have uh, an artistic block. Um, so it's called a creative block and literally has to do with a block. Um, but more on that as it gets actually filmed and made. Sure. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. And it, it's cool that you can, um, you, you said you're going to France. I have been planning oh, for okay. this ever. I, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a work trip. It's, it's a tax deductible. Work right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, <laughs> right. <laughs> so I know. Um, <laughs> I'm filming for one day and, and seeing friends for the other six. So I ha I've been okay. myself on this vacation for like a year and a half and I finally figured out because part of the film has to take place in Paris. You have to see that the character is walking around in Paris and it has to be recognizably the same. I'm trying to avoid the Eiffel Tower, but everything else I want to have in there, you know, might, we might yeah. stop at some point just to say Paris and then go on. You know? Just so you know, this is where we are. <laughs> There's a beautiful shot. It might be a GIF or it might be like a, 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 I forget if it's a still photograph, but it shows just an elevated subway train in Paris going by the Eiffel Tower. And I was like, oh, that's actually a really beautiful little segment. Um, because it doesn't actually, you don't actually have to see the Eiffel Tower straight on. It's just like, it's up here in the frame with the train just going past kind it. Of like in the background or something. It's backgrounded kinda. enough, but it's not so prominent that you have to hear accordion music. You know? <laughs> like if we are like, in France, just so you know. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, on my head, and nobody has ever It's the beginning of time. Elizabeth, over my shoulder. No, nobody talks like that. Let me hit you over the head with my baguette. <laughs> Exactly. Let me hit you with my scenery. It's my iconography of the city. Now, fortunately, I don't have to do that. Oh, that's not awesome. That's awesome. Uh, my, my friends and I talk about, you know, um, pieces of story that are, you know, like kind of beating people over the head with certain, you know, this is what we're doing. Bang! <laughs> Yeah. Do you get the metaphor? <laughs> you know? bash, bash. Uh, so. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I may or may not be taking you way away from the questions here. As I <laughs> oh, no, it's totally fine. It's totally okay. fine. Oh, uh, that's really cool, though. Actually, that's kind of all I have left for questions. Awesome. Um, puppets out now? I have puppets with me. What do you know? They're on this. Oh, really? Oh, that's amazing. I, I have puppets too. 
Do you have a preference? No. Do you want to see first? Well, I have Izzy right here on my lap, so we'll see her first because yes. she's the okay. star of the show, and I would have no internet presence at all if not for her. Of course not. Well, oh, oh, yes. No, no, she pretty much owes her whole entire career to me. Oh, who is this lovely fuzzy thing? Hi. Hi. How Hi. you doing? My name is Ido. Ido? Isn't that Ido. the original name of Tokyo or something like that? I have no idea. I'm just a little monster. Ah, you're a little monster. I'm a little monster. Oh, but, that's cool. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We both, uh, uh, we, we probably know some of the same people. Oh, that's true. That's true. Who, who do you know? <laughs> I know the Petersons. Do you know the Petersons? The, the, uh, the, the yeah. Oscar Petersons, not like the, not the Jim Petersons. They're monsters. They're yeah. monsters. Yeah, yeah, they own a chain of uh, car repair shops, and there's always soap opera playing in the lobby. The TV's always broken; you can't turn it off. It's always <laughs> that that's really funny. Hey, hey, Izzy. Yeah. Izzy. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. What is personal goals? Career uh, goals. Uh, Oh, yeah, okay. So, Izzy's personal goals are to ensure that in five years' time, all humans will be certified flushable. That is Izzy's goal. As president, I will make wow. sure that happens. Wow. And I'm running for office, but, uh, yeah. And I'm not sure how you feel about that. What? I, oh, oh, her. I, I didn't know it's the back so. Well, you know, she just does what she does, like the cat. I can't really control either of them. I, they, they both want me flushed. I mean, I, I, I have no say. In this. Oh, there's a kitty. Hi. He's going to show his butt. Come down here. That's where he Oh, this is so great. This is awesome. Here he is. Very good. You know, don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening either. It's okay. I never know. This cat's like <laughs> he loves the puppet. I don't know why. He he made several funny puppets. Just sitting on the couch. <laughs> so okay, now you're on my keyboard. Stop. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. I forgot to mention as a presidential candidate. Get out of my face. As a presidential candidate, I'm running on the pink party ticket. The pink the what? The what? I'm running on the ticket of the pink party. <laughs> okay, good. That makes sense. It does. I have. <laughs> I'm blue, but I have purple fluff. Purple fluff on head. Oh. Are, you, are you? I have to ask. Oh, go away, butt face. <laughs> I have to ask. Are you originally a sock, or is it just? I mean, is that racist? I, I don't want to ask about your origins. <laughs> no, it's okay. No, Ido. Ido original. Original. Ido. Yeah. Mm. Ido sewn from scrap. From scratch. Yeah. 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 <laughs> ow, ow, my face! Ah! Ah, yeah, and come back over here. Well, it's oh, been the cat's out. trying to steal the spotlight. Go away! <laughs> Get out of here! He's just so intense. It's so funny. He didn't bother me. I thought he was going to bother me the whole time that we were like talking, and he only comes up when the puppet comes up. <laughs> You, you, you have no interest until the puppet comes up. He cannot stay off my body. What? That's a problem. I mean, you understand. I understand, but still. I mean, how sure. is that? Sure. Yes, <laughs> yes you do a very cute, fluffy monster. Thank you. Yes. Oh, how? Oh. Yeah, here it comes. There's <laughs> like nothing but cat here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, that's so great. Oh, lap cat, unfortunately. If he were a lap cat, it would be so much easier to just get him to sit. 
but he won't. He won't. He <laughs> not into physical contact in that way. It's on his terms. Oh. It's on his terms. Kind of like me. Izzy is actually based on on my cat on Murky, sure for Mercutio. So oh, okay, half of her personality. That's funny. Not necessarily all the um, carnal drives that, that she has on the show. And I appreciate that you're in puppet ministry and will still talk to me, by the way, after seeing Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's just sad. Um, it's, well, I mean, thank you. <laughs> well, like I was saying, I think um, before, before we started uh, the interview, before we went live, um, uh, you know, I... I I appreciate the show. I think it's really funny, but it's not something I would do. What do you mean? You know, it's not. It's not me. I'm over there. I'll take you. <laughs> it's not me. You know, if I tried to do a show like yours, it would be. It would not work. It would not work at all because that's not something. I don't think it that I would do. <laughs> I honestly, I wasn't sure it would work for me. So there you go. I well. I think it works, and I think it's very funny. It's just, you. Uh, you know, personally, it's a personal thing. You know, no, no, I, 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 I would mean, do. understand. I, you know, there, there are people who, there, there are people who I appreciate a lot that I would never do what they do. You know, and of course, yeah, it way, but, sure. you know, yeah. It's made it. It's like natural to them, and it works, and it's usually. You know, you, you can always tell when somebody's doing something that just completely comes from them because nobody else is doing anything like it. It's like, there's only, right. there's only one in the mold, basically. Right. And then you can also tell if somebody is trying to force it, you know, if it's like, no. you know, if they're trying to force something that's not from them, you know, it's, it can be pretty obvious that it's not. It is. And, you know, I... I hesitate to condemn only because like there's it's so hard to do and some people all they can really do is what's topical or what's you know what you should yeah. be doing uh, I, I know people who definitely are doing that they're doing something that you know from a distance I would say this isn't something that you would do given all the choice in the world it's something that you're doing because you feel that the only way to get your voice out there is to take on a, a cause that's hot right now or something it's not, it's not like there's any shame in that. It's just that it, to me, and maybe only to me, it always comes off as not entirely, it comes off as a little disingenuous. And exactly. Course, yeah. I not genuine. It's like, well, yeah. I mean, I don't want to tell people when they're being honest because I don't have any idea what their honesty is to them. So I, right. you know, I've had a lot of people say to me when I'm being funny, oh, you're not being honest. And I'm like, Actually, when I'm not being funny, I'm usually not being honest. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right, right. So it's yeah. a very difficult and slippery slope. You don't want to say, oh, somebody's just capitalizing. I think there is a lot of that. I've seen that where um, somebody, the, the worst examples to me are when somebody goes up, they have a project, and they'll say, this is a metaphor for discrimination. And it is so clearly anything but this is a vehicle for you. Just my God, there's no shame in that. Just say it. You know, there, there's nothing wrong with saying, actually, I look really great and I wanted to be on TV. <laughs> you know, And I think a lot of the time that's what it is. <laughs> so, that sounds so mean. I, that, I don't, I don't know that that is ever anybody. I'm sort of, when I say this, I am sort of voicing an amalgam of projects, both theater and film and whatever that I've seen over time and that people have stated lofty goals for. And, you know, you kind of find yourself being like, I don't know. But, <laughs> you know, I, I could be so wrong. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. But it's, you know. Yeah. And, and on the flip side, uh, kind of on the flip side of things, uh, you know, coming from um, a, I don't really call it a religious background, but other people would, I guess. Like going to um, <laughs> what? Like going to church, going to church or specifically I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in a Christian home and you know, I'm a Christian and I, you know, that's just my life and I have no, I have nothing else. Um, <laughs> uh, I have no other recollections besides that, but um 
uh, you know, we've got the um, the uh, Christian uh, film industry and music industry, and you know, and we've got like our Christian versions of of other things, and oh my goodness, so much of that can be very not genuine. Like, I mean, and I, I don't want to name names about it or anything. Like, I don't want to name anything, but, but it's like, I mean, I, I understand that your heart is totally in the right place. I, I understand your heart. I really do. Yeah. But what you're doing is not, it, you're, you're hurting it. <laughs> you're hurting the cause. <laughs> Just stop. <laughs> yeah, Please. you can't say anything else about that. That kind of hits it. <laughs> it's like you are the problem, actually. <laughs> this no, is like, I get that. So, it's uh, an it, endemic in many religions and and cultures and and you know facets of the industry. Anyway, yeah. I think I cut you off. Anyway. No, it's it's totally fine. Um, yeah, it happens. I think it happens on both sides that um, people are interested and in, they're not interested in telling a good story, but they're they want to um, just, uh, I guess, they want to try to just. I don't want to say that they just want to make money, but sometimes it's true. Like sometimes that's what it feels like. I mean, you know, and it just, it makes me uncomfortable anyway. <laughs> I mean, you know, I can understand that some people will be like, if I just make the project that I would make in an ideal world, I will make no money. I will have no viewers. I will have no fill in the blank. This will, this will be a non-starter. I understand that because very likely it could be a non-starter, but it's still better than putting all your eggs in the basket of a project that you don't as much care about, and again, this is hypothetical, I'm not specifically referring to anybody, but it's better than putting your eggs in the basket of a project that is disingenuous and may as well equally be a non-starter. <laughs> you know? Right, yeah. I think that's that's the, the major issue there. Yeah, yeah. You can't really, nothing is surefire. Right, yep. Um, we were doing puppets, right? Yeah. Yeah, they were around here somewhere. Um, oh, that's do you right. have other ones? I do. I have. Uh, I have a princess puppet here. Oh, 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 a princess puppet. Yes. Oh. And who do you I have? have? Well, you know what? I oh, I didn't even think about this before. I have a princess puppet that I made, but um, Ooh. she's in the box. She's across the room in the box. Um, the Bronx, that's where I am. <laughs> I'm going to have a cat on me again. <laughs> it's another cat. Get out of my oh, house. It's the same cat. Yeah. Oh, get out of my palm of my face. Get your butt out of my face. Oh. <laughs> where have you totally ruled? Hello, other puppet. Hi. Hello. Hello, what's your name? Oh, my name is Marceline, and I am, get out of here. Mar Marceline. Okay. Marceline, hi Marceline, my name's Gloria. Oh yes, you did the promo video, I knew I recognized yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I did. Mm. <laughs> Very familiar. Oh, Cass, get over here. Yes. I, I love your crown, it's so pretty. Oh. Thank you, I got it to, to a discount rate, but don't tell anybody. Oh, oh, okay. It's live. What are you the princess of? What are you the princess of? Oh, this table! This table right here! That's why I don't like the cat being on it, because he's technically infringing on my territory. Oh, okay. Prideful real she... beast! Get out of my sight! Oh! I don't like the it, cat. Are you the princess of whatever you're standing on at the moment? Oh, I'm sorry, say that again. Are you the princess of whatever you're standing on at the moment? Yes, yes, you can't see it, can you? But I'm... Uh, Yes, I'm atop a table, and it's mine, mine, mine. Oh, that's wonderful. Hey, you know what? I'm, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I'm training to be a uh, an escape artist. Really? I wish this cat would train to be an escape artist and escape from my kingdom. <laughs> now tell me about you. 
enough about us. <laughs> so, so princess, you. Princess, um, what are your professional goals, and how are you moving toward them? Well, my professional goals are when I get old and gray to replace this hair with spaghetti, and no one would be the wiser. And I learn to cook so that it can even be boiled because I don't do things halfway. I don't have an accent from anywhere in particular either. You notice I'm not really doing any work. <laughs> oh, this is so great. Oh, I love this. I love oh, talking yeah. to you. I find you amusing. What was, what was your name again? Marceline. Marceline. Marceline, yes. It was Marceline. lovely to meet you, Princess Marceline. And you do. Mar Mar I give you a royal kiss. Mwah. 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 <laughs> Bye now. Oh, my goodness. Goodbye. Oh, my goodness. Bye. See you later. Bye. Bye, Mar Marceline. <laughs> what is her hair? Is that... Uh, it is an actual wig. I'm it so is a wig from like Party wig. City. From where? Well, from Party um, City. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Um, and are you a project puppet puppet? If you don't mind my asking a personal question. Um, she is. I think I'm pretty sure I modified the pattern just a little bit. Um, <laughs> I like I love but their not, I love modifying them. I know some people swear against them. I I, I like them and I, I I like modifying. Oh yeah. I made oh, yeah. I think I I think I shrank it a little bit, and I think I extended her neck a little bit. Before we go, I have to show you. This is an older, yeah. much older puppet. I have to run off and get it, but I have a okay. big white whale that I made from probably that same pattern. So enjoy the cat. He's gonna be my test pattern here while I go off for a minute. I'll okay. be back. I can also entertain. I, I can say. entertain. Okay. 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 We'll watch the cat. Did he go? He went away. Oh, there he goes. I was trying to keep them entertained. I was going to say, he, uh, yeah, I wondered if he would bite you, actually. So I don't know if you can tell, but this is a beluga puppet, quite large. And oh my goodness. Yeah. That is so awesome. I have <laughs> eyes that are made from ping pong balls with felt right over them. And I do a lot of puppet shows for children who try to pull my eyeballs right off. Oh, they always do that, don't they? Oh, they yeah. always grab their eyeballs. Hi. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, they always well either the the number one thing of course is put their fingers in the mouth and then try to rip off the eyeballs. So this is actually Project Puppet as well. And it's just Oh wow. Seems to be an enormous you can't really see him too well over over uh Skype, over Google Hangout. The the shape doesn't too well show, but it's basically the same as an enormous uh, pillow, like a body pillow. Yeah. <laughs> to have eyes and look like a little yoga. Oh, I used to. So awesome. Since, since last year, I've done I've, I've done it much less, but I used to do a library show of Kipling's Just So stories, and one of them is how the whale got his throat, and so he was the whale for how the whale got his throat. A little tiny white That's whale. That's so fun. <laughs> yeah. I like the wheel. Oh, thank you. I'll bring him back up. Okay. Ah, there he goes. He just, he descended under the sea. I won't, Hello. I won't talk. So. Oh, yeah, no, we can talk. We can talk. I mean, I can't blow bubbles, so what do I have left to do except talk? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> well, see, when I talk, the camera goes on me. Oh, I see. Oh, when I talk, the camera goes on the cat. <laughs> oh my god. I'm about to run out of battery here too. Oh, okay. Well, I have, just to be sure, I don't want it to run out in the middle. I have okay. eight minutes remaining. Okay. Well, I think we're about done anyway. But, um, mm -hmm. um, Nicola? Yes. Will you please tell the viewers 
um, where they can find you on like social media and like websites and blah, 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 blah. Yes, I will. So then we'll start with the name of my show, which is Callie and Izzy, which is C-A-L-L-I-E-A-N-D-I-Z-Z-Y. You can put in Facebook slash Callie and Izzy, Instagram slash Callie and Izzy, or Twitter slash Callie and Izzy, and you can find the show at all three of those places. Uh, there is also a website called Callie and Izzy, same thing, dot Weebly, W-E-E-B-L-Y dot com. And those are the main places. We are on YouTube under Callie ampersand at sign Izzy. Um, that's the official name of the show. It has an ampersand. Uh, that's it. Those are the places. Awesome. We're also you die. We're on Vimeo. We're now on a thing called Sterable, which is cool. Um, if you Google Kelly ampersand Izzy, you'll find all the places and also screenshots of us doing various weird things. And our season two premieres on YouTube and all those other places on October 6th, which is this coming Thursday. Yay! 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kermit hands. Um, Kermit hands. Okay, and all of that, all of that information will be in the description below cool. in the in the video. So that way they can just Spelled. click extra measure what's that so then i just spelled it for extra measure of course of why course. not why not That's great yeah because they might want to just type it in yeah exactly instead of click because that would be harder i think but whatever anyway thank you so much this thank has you. been so much fun this was so oh, my fun. word thank you for thinking of me <laughs> I, I had a blast thank you for agreeing to come to this Anytime. thing that I'm not sure how long it will take or how much longer I'm going to be doing it, but I hope hey, that I it will last I think you'll find a lot of women in puppetry. I think there are a lot of us out there. I mean, yeah. even just in New York, I think there are a lot, and I don't know who's, you know, beyond New York and Boston and some of the other places that I know puppeteers in. So there's probably a lot of people hiding, you know, hiding under puppets. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> hiding behind hiding under a pile of puppets <laughs> you'll find them you'll find them we'll network oh so great thank you nicola and we'll talk soon and thank you everyone for watching bye 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 See you next time <laughs>